everybody for my topic i'd like just to thank uh, pps norlu for giving me this chance to talk on the care of a child's skin with childhood dermatosis these are my disclosures i speak for several pharma companies but for this talk um, i have nothing to disclose so these are the learning objectives for this um for this 30 minutes or less discussion. So we will review the role of skin microbiome. I would be presenting common childhood dermatosis that we encounter in the clinics. And we, will, we should be able to differentiate these common eczemas looking at their pathogenesis, manifestations, trigger factors. And I will be discussing briefly treatment strategies for each. So the skin microbiome refers to the diverse community of microorganisms, including billions of beneficial and harmful bacteria coexisting on the skin surface. It has been estimated that 1 billion bacteria inhabits just one centimeter square of human skin. The skin microbiome prefers a relatively acidic environment, a pH of around 5, which also inhibits the growth of pathogens. And this was mentioned earlier. Viruses, bacteria, and fungi, which are represented by your colored dots, cover the human skin and its appendages. The commensal microbes would inhibit pathogen growth by competition and crowding on the skin surface. The skin structures also inhibit pathogen colonization by the production of your antimicrobial peptides, and these are from your keratinocytes and free fatty acids by your sebocytes. The microbiota therefore interacts with the immune cells to activate them or modulate their production of pro and anti-inflammatory cytokines. So what is the role of commensal microbes in the form of your Staphylococcus epidermidis? They contribute to host immunity by inhibiting the growth of pathogenic microbes. Indirectly, their presence on the skin results in the competition for nutrients and space, thus greatly impacting the potential for growth when pathogens are introduced on the skin surface. They also enhance innate immunity by activating the toll-like receptors, as you can see here, and ultimately, it would result to the expression of your antimicrobial peptides. And they would also prime your adaptive immunity with the, end with the end result of promoting um, skin, um, the skin being intact. So I'd like to start with my first poll question. What are the following factors that would affect microbial diversity? So is it letter A, B, C, or D? So five, four, three, Two, one. May we see the result of the poll? So can we now see? Okay, so most of you got it right, no? So the correct answer can be seen in the next slide, but yes, it's all of the above. So, as early as pregnancy, the maternal vaginal infections or periodontitis can result in bacteria invading the uterine environment. Gut and oral microbiota could be transported to the bloodstream from the mother to the fetus. The mode of delivery also shapes the initial bacterial inoculum of the newborn. Genetics, as well as postnatal factors such as breastfeeding versus formula and introduction of solid food, skin to skin contact will all play a critical part in the development of the microbiome in early childhood. Other factors such as your antibiotic use and environmental exposures further configure the microbiome during early life. And as diet diversifies with the puberty stage, the microbiome would shift towards an adult-like configuration. 
So what happens when there is an imbalance of microorganisms, this is termed as dysbiosis, it would ultimately lead to inflammatory and the expression of allergic diseases. So as mentioned earlier by Dr. Matias, the skin has several roles. Firstly, obviously, as a physical factor, so it protects the skin by absorbing the ultraviolet radiation, reducing your transepidermal water loss, and preventing penetration of chemicals and most especially your pathogens. The epidermis comprises several layers of keratinocytes, including the two layers that would seal off uh, the outer environment, your stratum corneum, which is composing of your corneocytes and your stratum granulosum, which is actually a living layer of cells that generate tight junction between adjacent cells. The skin also acts as an immunologic barrier. So its immune response is vital for wounds or infections, but also modulates the commensal microbiota that would colonize the skin. The keratinocytes continuously sample the microbiota colonizing the skin surface through pattern recognition receptors or your PRRs. And these are your toll-like receptors, your NODs and your MANOS receptors. Through the pattern recognition, uh, through the uh, antigen, through the organism spams or what you call the pathogen associated molecular patterns. The activation of your keratinocyte PRRs by your pumps would immediately initiate the innate immune response, ultimately resulting to the production of your pro-inflammatory cytokines, your chemokines, adhesion molecules, and even your antimicrobial peptides, which, are, which will all be protective of the skin. So despite being constantly exposed to the large number of microorganisms, the skin can discriminate between harmless commensal microorganisms and harmful pathogenic microorganisms. The mechanism for this discrimination is not yet fully clear, but may involve the induction of your immune tolerance. Your toll-like receptors may be desensitized by prolonged exposure to the commensal microorganisms, either through decreased toll-like receptor expression on the cell surface or by activation of the toll-like receptor pathway inhibitors. On the other hand, when pathogenic microbes enter the skin, keratinocyte pattern recognition receptor PRRs, such as the toll-like receptors, are activated and recognize the pathogen-associated molecular pattern or your pumps. And again, it would end up to the production of your chemokines, cytokines, and your antimicrobial peptides, which will all manage to eradicate the pathogenic microorganism. So with that, we will now take a look at the child's compromised skin. So I chose to present this in the form of eczema or dermatitis, which is the most common skin diagnosis that we see in our clinic, occurring at around 30 to 40% of the time. So accurate diagnosis is crucial to success, no? And we will see that your eczema or your dermatitis is defined as a non-contagious dermatitis with typical features of pruritus erythema papules, vesicles, or desquamation. And it often results from various endogenous activators or exogenous um, noxious substances. And your endogenous eczema is exemplified by your atopic eczema but as you can see, it can overlap with your exogenous eczema. Your exogenous eczema is exemplified by your contact dermatitis. And in between, you have your dysregulative microbial eczema, which I will be discussing uh, in a while. So we will start with atopic dermatitis. So this is a very common disease. No? It's also known as atopiform dermatitis or your allergic eczema. It is a component of the allergic march. And on your right-hand panel, you will see here how the allergic march is illustrated. The green line stands for atopic dermatitis, which you see occurs very early on on a child's life and closely linked with the red line, which is your food allergy. But as the child grows, these two will eventually be seen to be outgrown. And then later on, you would see the upsurge of your respiratory allergies. So clinical presentation is highly variable depending upon the patient's age and disease activity. In infants and young children, as you have seen earlier, atopic dermatitis typically presents with pruritic, red, scaly, and crusted lesions on the extensor surfaces and cheeks or scalp. The acute lesions can include vesicles and there can be serous exudates and crusty in severe cases. This is usually sparing the diaper area. 
And in older children and adolescents up to 16 years of age, you would note that atopic dermatitis is often demonstrated as lichenified plaques in a flexural distribution, especially the antecubital and popliteal fossa, the volar aspects of the wrist, ankles, and neck. The sides of the neck may also be involved, and we term this as the atopic dirty neck. And these are the examples of presentations of atopic dermatitis depending with the age. So this biosis is often best demonstrated in atopic dermatitis. As you can see on the left-hand screen panel, this is a normal microbiome. And you would see here that there is a high diversity of microbes with the different compositions of your stuff, your firmicutes, and so on. And on the right side, this is the example of a skin of a child with atopic dermatitis. And you would notice that there is a lessened diversity with predominance of your Staphylococcus species. So, but remember that there are other triggers for atopic dermatitis, such as the following. In this study, it showed that sweating or perspiration is the most common, followed by irritating cloths like your wool, emotional stress at 81%, food is only seen at 50%, and then this is followed by your common cold or viral infections, and then um, indoor allergens such as your dust mite. So now we move on to the second question. So comparing a child's normal skin with that of a child with atopic dermatitis, which statement is true? Is it letter A? Is it letter B? Is it letter C? And is it letter D? So I'll give you siguro eight seconds. So eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Can we see the results of the poll question? So majority says that a normal skin exhibits increased microbial diversity. And that is correct. So moving on. This um, slide will just again summarize that question. It gives you the correct answer. Basing on the skin microbiome, we now um, review now that the normal skin is highly colonized by your commensals. The composition is highly diverse. And as compared to the AD skin, less colonized by your but less colonized by the commensal, there is low diversity and there is increased colonization by your staph or use. As to the production of your antimicrobial peptides, they are inducible in the normal skin, but in AD skin, this is inhibited by your Th2 cytokines. The immune system is intact in the normal skin, whereas in the AD skin, the skin is always pro-inflammatory and again, predominantly TH2 in phenotype expression. For pH, again, the normal skin is always acidic, whereas the AD skin is neutral to alkaline. And for barrier function, this is intact in the normal skin, while in the AD skin, this is not. Okay, so the correct answer is letter A. So for diagnosis, we are very familiar with this criteria, which is most commonly used, no? the Hanifin and Rika criteria. We need three of four major criteria, and you would always note that pruritus is the quintessential feature of atopic dermatitis with lots of minor criteria. However, recently, there is the UK refinement of the Hanifin and Rika criteria, which is used internationally for research purposes and to define better atopic dermatitis. And Take a look at this. It is an itchy skin in the past 12 months, plus three or more of the following, an onset before two years of age, involvement of the flexures, history of generally dry skin, history of other atopic diseases, or history
So, we would like to apologize for the, ano? Ayan. I'm sorry, so, can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, Doctora. Saan ako nag-end? Pathogenesis? Uh, before niyan, Doctora. Ah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I will go back. Oh my. So, uh, recently I was saying that your Hanifin and Rika criteria, uh, there was a refinement, the UK refinement of this criteria. And this is, I think, a better one because it's the one being used internationally for researches and to define your atopic dermatitis. So its components is an itchy skin in the past 12 months, plus three or more of the following, an onset before two years of age, lectural involvement, history of generally dry skin, history of other atopic diseases, or history in the first degree relative if the child is under four years of age, and a visible flexural dermatitis. For the pathogenesis, we know that is this, uh, there is a skin barrier dysfunction. There is a loss of function mutation of your filled green and tight junction gene mutation with the reduction of the ceramides. There is an altered microbiota favoring an increased of uh, increase of staph or use and fungi infections. The activated inflammatory pathways is there. Increased TH2 responses uh, is the one that is the mode versus your TH1 response. And of course, there is immunologically biphasic response, which initially, as you can see in this very good illustration, in an acute flare, the first one is that of a TH2 cytokine response. And later on in the chronic stages, it will be switched to a TH1 cytokine response. So this is another way of understanding it. These are the different trigger factors. It's an interplay of your host and the environment. So if you look at the host, so the genes is there. There is a problem with the, there is a gene mutation of your filagrin gene. And the immature child, uh, it's being, a, the child being a child predisposes him to um, atopic dermatitis. But as the child grows older, you would see the natural course that the child can outgrow the atopic dermatitis. However, in some uh, individuals, the atopic dermatitis will persist. Now, as for the environment, we have the hygiene hypothesis, which just tells us that an early exposure to clean dirt will protect you against your TH2 responses. And uh, you have the role of food, wherein in uh, severe atopic dermatitis uh, cases in children, food allergy is seen to have a very significant role. And of course, the indoor environment. For the environment, it also consists, uh, take note of the role of biologic materials, your chemicals, physical uh, factors like change in temperature, which we are experiencing here in Baguio a lot, static electricity, as well as exposure to your electronic gadgets. And I think this is one important uh, trigger factors, especially during this pandemic. Also the presence of your particulate matters outdoor and indoor, and your practice, the practice of hygiene, uh, moisturizing, and exposure to irritating uh, clothing. So not to be outdone is also the role of autoallergens. So your autoallergens are your Ig um, happens when your Ig antibodies um, react against human proteins in patients with severe atopic dermatitis. The allergic inflammation is maintained by the release of these human proteins from damaged skin, and this is seen in chronic atopic dermatitis. So the key points is we have to emphasize that in effectively treating this condition, we manage the disease and not cure it. We prepare the patient for the chronicity of the management of this disease and emphasizing that this will not only affect the patient, but also the patient's family. Together with that, is that researchers have also shown that atopic dermatitis, if not managed well, will have an impact on the health-related quality of life impairment. It is equal to many chronic diseases of childhood like diabetes, and AD and sleep disturbance are, are at higher risk of developing uh, atopic uh, your ADHD. And in adolescents with atopic dermatitis, they're at significant risk of impaired quality of life similar to having acne vulgaris. So how do we manage now your atopic dermatitis? So patients with mild atopic dermatitis can be primarily managed with persistent moisturizer use combined with the other basic management principles of your skincare. So your moisturizers, again, the choice depends on patient's preference, liberally applied and uh, very frequently applied, warm uh, baths or showers, and then antiseptic measures. We can use dilute bleach baths 
and uh, avoidance of triggers. So avoid common irritants, as we have mentioned, temperature extremes, and proven allergens. Patients with moderate, uh, patients with uh, mild diseases on acute flares should be managed with a low potency corticosteroid cream or ointment. And this is applied one to two times a day for two to four weeks. Emollients should continue to be applied multiple times per day in conjunction with the topical corticosteroids. Patients with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis should follow the same management principles as those with uh, the mild disease. Acute flares in patients with moderate to severe diseases should be treated with um, medium potency uh, topical corticosteroids for up to three days after clearance. So in patients with flares which do not resolve in seven days, consider the following. Is the diagnosis correct? Is there a good adherence? And is there presence of infection? And do we have to refer these patients to the specialists? So after a resolution of flare in a patient with moderate to severe disease, maintenance therapy should be initiated to reduce subsequent flares and relapses. Your maintenance therapy can be with either a topical calcineurin inhibitor or a topical steroid. When a topical calcineurin inhibitor is used, it should be applied two to three times a week, but can be used up to twice a day in patients who are unresponsive. When your topical corticosteroids are used, the potency should be chosen based on the area of skin affected. Patients with eczema in areas other than the face or eyes should continue the medium potency corticosteroids. And patients with eczema in sensitive areas, including skin folds, have to use a lower potency corticosteroid. This slide would just emphasize to us that moisturizers remains a cornerstone to AD therapy. So for the sensitive skin, it helps protect it. It improves the skin tone and texture and can even mask your, imperfection, your skin imperfections. And there are also topical steroid patients, as I've mentioned in the management, in the form of your topical calcineurin inhibitors. And also there are some emollients with ingredients that are also anti-inflammatory, hence they're termed as steroid sparing agents. We move on to contact dermatitis. So contact dermatitis, as we know of, is, an, is any eczematous uh, skin disorder that results when the particular substance comes in contact with the skin. And we know that it is the irritant contact dermatitis that is more common versus your allergic contact dermatitis. And I think this is my third poll question. So regarding allergic contact dermatitis, which statement best describes it? Is it letter A? It occurs in previously sensitized, predisposed child. Letter B, concentration is usually, usually high. Letter C, onset is minutes to hours. Letter D, all of the above. Remember, this is allergic contact dermatitis. Patients who have allergic contact dermatitis, they are at risk because they are previously sensitized and are genetically predisposed. And the mechanism is, of course, immunologic and they uh, that is because they exhibit the delayed type hypersensitivity reaction. Now for the concentration of the offending agent, it's usually high for your irritant contact derm and it's dose dependent versus your allergic contact derm wherein it might be low threshold dose, which is all or nothing. So the offending, uh, the irritants are different for irritant contact derm versus your allergic contact derm and I will be showing this in a while. And the risk if the patient is atomic, atopic is surprisingly increased for, in, for an irritant contact dermatitis versus for atopic, uh, for allergic contact dermatitis. And um, so the typical onset would occur minutes to hours for patients with irritant contact dermatitis, and it could be hours to days for your allergic contact dermatitis. Okay, so this is a picture showing to you your allergic contact dermatitis. Um, patient. So the more common or the most common contactants are your formaldehyde if there is clothing dermatitis. For shoe dermatitis, it's because of rubber. For nickel dermatitis, these are found in your earrings. For the diapers, they are uh, because of the dyes. The dyes that would make uh, the diaper seem uh, whiter and the rubber in the elastic uh, belt. For the fragrances, that's because of the perfumes and colognes. And for uh, the dye, it's because of your paraphenylene or your hina tattoo. So all of those are your triggers for your allergic contact dermatitis. Now for your irritant contact dermatitis, 
again, your atopic dermatitis children are particularly susceptible for this type. So these are the most common irritants. If it occurs circumorally, as you can see in these pictures, it could be because of the direct contact of food and not necessarily ingested, or a regurgitation of food particles, or a dribbling of the saliva. But it could also be caused by your soap, talcum, and bu bu uh, bubble baths, and even your detergents. And take note, your bodily fluids are highly irritant. So your urine, the feces, and uh, diaper dermatitis for those on uh, still using their diapers. Now for the management, if we do not know the cause of the contact dermatitis, we refer our patients to our favorite dermatologist for a patch test. And this is how it looks like. And for the therapeutics, once the cause is known, whether by history or by patch test, avoidance is, uh, should be there. And then skincare, making use of your mild soap, and of course your emollients. And as supportive, you have to put them on antihistamines and give them steroids. Now, moving on to the next one is your intertrigo. So the picture speaks for itself. So it's frequently found in skin folds in these areas. And for intertrigo, what do we have to watch out in a child is the uh, formation per candidal intertrigo. So just like the diaper dermatitis, they could appear beefy red or bright red plaques and they have multiple satellite papules. And the treatment is composed of your is co uh, composed of your topical mild steroid cream for one to two weeks, your topical antifungal cream for two weeks, and keeping the area dry if the patient is still on diaper for a young child. So frequent changes and wear loose cotton underwear, preferably. Next is your arthropod by reaction. So this is very straightforward, no? It may appear as papular urticaria, and it is also termed as uh, pop, uh, papular urticaria or insect bite-induced hypersensitivity. So they are chronic or recurrent papules, vesicles, or wheels. And this is because of a hypersensitivity reaction to that stinging or biting insect, whether it's a flea, a midge, or a mosquito. And the, how do they appear? The lesions, as you can see, appear in linear clusters in exposed areas, and they are inst intensely prolific. And uh, if there are new bites, they're often accompanied by reactivation of old ones. So why is it important to this Because they may form post-inflammatory hypo or hyperpigmented scars, depending on how light is the skin of the child. But the good thing is that we expect that there is development of immunologic tolerance when the child reaches five to seven years of age. So the treatment is for us to let our children, our patients wear protective clothing, judicious use of insect repellents because this might become irritating to them as well. And then of course, control the source aggressively or mosquito control measures. We have to use high potency topical steroids because usually the affected areas are your exposed areas, which are your extremities and supportive treatment with antihistamines. The next one is your dyshydrotic eczema. So this is uh, termed also as pompholix because of its bubble-like appearance as you can see in this picture. So it is recurrent or chronic. And again, um, having atopic dermatitis is a predisposition to this hydrotic uh, eczema. And it is very itching or burning. That is why they come to the clinic. So where is it find, found? So the sites of affectations are the palms, the soles, or the sides of the fingers and the toes. So again, for treatment, put these patients on emollients. Um, we can advise soaks or compresses if the skin is oozing and crusting. So 15 minutes once to twice a week. And then, of course, apply your potent steroids because the affected skin areas are thick skin areas. And I think this is the last one, your numular eczema. So it's also known as your discoid eczema because the appearance is that of discrete coin-shaped lesions. And again, this is intensely prolific. And again, this is associated with atopic dermatitis but also in children undergoing emotional stress and those with dry skin. So the site is, um, these lesions are usually found on the extensor surface of the extremities and the trunk. And the treatment is put these patients on emollients, give them antihistamines, and then uh, apply moderate to potent steroids. And I included this slide, this is my lecture if I give a lecture on skin because I'd like to emphasize that we have to know how much are we going to apply. And the most practical method is the fingertip unit. 
and this is uh, using the fingertip, the distal end of your distal of your second finger. And depending on the age of your patients and the areas affected, this should be how many fingertip units should uh, be applied on the specific area. Hence, we should also know how many tubes of steroids are we going to prescribe. Otherwise, the parent will just buy one tube and our patient's condition will never improve. So my last question, which is a correct pair among these steroids based on their potency ranking? Is it letter A? Is it letter B? Is it letter C? Or is it letter D? So please key in your answers. Five, four, three, two, and one. So can we have the results? Okay, so the results are very variable. That means we have to review uh, the next table I'll be showing you. So the correct answer is class is letter C, class 7, which is exemplified by your hydrocortisone. So I will not also miss out on this table. I always show it every time I lecture, just a reminder and a review for everybody. So class 1 is always your super potent, and class 7 is your mildest. So in that question... Uh, letter C is correct. So class 7 is hydrocortisone, be it 1% or 2.5%, and your methylprednisolone 1%. Okay, this is my last slide. When do we work with the dermatologist for our children? No? When there is an uncertainty for biopsy, and when there is significant psychosocial problems for the child and caregiver, when the quality of life is impaired. In cases of infection, when our patients has not responded to the standard uh, bacterial control and is experiencing severe and recurrent infections, or we suspect eczema herpeticum, especially if your child has atopic dermatitis, this is an urgent condition because it requires the same day treatment, so we refer them to our favorite dermatologist. With regards to treatment, when our patient has not responded satisfactorily to optimum topical therapy, when we want their advice on treatment applications such as application of wet traps and again if our patients are experiencing severe social or psychological problems and i would like to end it with a short summary so earlier on we discussed the skin microbiome and its importance the role of the skin commensal bacteria uh, and its role in the host immunity as well as um, i also discussed common childhood dermatosis or eczema which are characterized by their hyperproliferation, inflammation, and immunologic management. And they emphasize atopic dermatitis because it is the most common one that we see in our clinics. And again, the, the management for atopic dermatitis, that moisturizers are the cornerstone of atopic therapy, uh, atopic dermatitis therapy. And again, steroids are still the mainstay anti-inflammatory agents. And in choosing the right steroid, one must know the disease, know the drug, and know the patient. And with that, I am begging your indulgence and thank you for listening.